thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Linda Kilbert and I work with the library in Johnson County. Um, this is a special uh, lecture series in honor of Denise Anderson Decina. As you can see, we're very thankful for her impact on this group. And so we want that to be honored and continued. Um, we're very privileged today to have another member of CIDIG. You were with us last time you met um, Angela. Uh, she is an avid genealogist and been so for over 20 years. She teaches teens and adults how to um, effectively research their families using both traditional historic sources and the genetic genealogy testing. She's a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists the National Genealogical Society and several other genealogy organizations, as well as holding leadership positions in local genealogical societies. Angela holds a bachelor's degree in history, a certificate in genealogical research from Boston University, and has completed an 18 month program in professional genealogy called ProGen. In addition, she's attended several genealogical institutes focusing on advanced genealogy research methodology and numerous national and regional conferences. So she brings to us a wealth of experience and um, uh, education and, and information on this topic. So I will now uh, go ahead and turn it over to Ange. All right, well, welcome. I'm so glad all of you have joined us today. Um, today, I am going to be talking about um, ancestry and kind of giving you a walkthrough of um, what you can find there once you get your test results and information there. Um, as Linda said, please feel free to add your questions to the chat. I'm pretty informal, so if you have any questions, um, I don't mind if um, we stop and answer those at that time. And if it's something that I'm going to be answering in a couple of minutes, I'll let you know that and we can continue on. So um, with Ancestry, a lot of things that I'm going to be talking about today are applicable to other testing companies. Um, and I highly recommend if you have not tested at other companies to do so or to take your DNA test results from Ancestry and you can upload them to other, co other companies. Um, and I just want to, I put a note to remind myself that Father's Day is coming up next weekend and Ancestry and a lot of the other DNA companies are starting their sales already. So if you are interested in testing siblings or cousins, um, now is a great time to purchase those kits. Okay, so without further ado, um, once you get your Ancestry results back, this is the page, this is kind of the landing page of what you'll discover. Um, one of the things that I receive a lot of questions about can be answered up over here in that settings box on the far right hand side. So before I dive into ethnicity and, and your shared matches and what have you, I want to kind of point out the settings and what information you can find over in that box. So this is one huge long screen. So you have to keep scrolling and you'll find each section. Um, so the first section that we have is our test details where you put in your name and, and what have you. And then we have our tree link. So it tells you that this tree is linked to living in the EG DNA tree, family tree. That's what I've named it. Um, you want to make sure that you have actually linked your ancestry tree to your DNA. And another thing that you need to make sure of is a lot of times you might be managing a kit for your son or daughter, for a brother or sister, a cousin, you wanna make sure that you are linking the tree to, you not only select the tree, but you also select the person who's the test taker. And you wanna make sure that the test taker is the person that is linked in the tree appropriately. Otherwise it throws off your through lines. 
Um, it really befuddles all of us that are taking a look at your tree and trying to figure out who you are and how you might be related to them. Um, so you'll wanna pay attention to that. Uh, scrolling down a little bit, you do have tree privacy um, information. And this is this privacy information is specifically about DNA and how you want your name listed, et cetera. But if you click over here in the tree link, it brings up here not only how um, what tree that you're listed to, you can select a different tree if you'd like, and then it'll also prompt you to pick that individual. If you go down here on the far right hand side, I have highlighted the box where it says, learn more about the privacy of your family tree. So this is specifically how your family tree will be shown to other people that are taking a look at your testing results. And so Ancestry is doing a much better job of trying to inform their users about what goes on behind the scenes. If you wanna find out more information about any sort of setting or their science, look around. A lot of times they do have information there that you can click on and find out more information. So in here, it's talking about privacy for your family tree. So when you're with Ancestry, this is not specific to DNA. It's specific to the, um, the family tree that you're building, that you're linking census records and, and marriage and death records and all of that. Um, so that family tree, you do have an option of making it public, private, or unindexed. And they will go ahead and explain a little bit more about what that is. But in a nutshell, public means that anybody can view your tree. All of those living people will be suppressed and living details will not be provided. But anybody who is marked deceased, that information will be available for people to take a look at. A private tree, on the other hand, is not viewable by anybody. However, when you do searches, when somebody does a search, for example, when you're in shared matches and you do a surname search, you're looking for everybody in your shared matches that have the same surname, say O'Brien. Um, it will, Ancestry, will search not only all those public trees, but they'll also search the private trees. And so those private trees will pop up. And that's one way to get a clue as to how these people are related if you're doing surname searches. And then finally, unindexed trees. That's more of what we think about when, when you talk about being private. Unindexed trees means that ancestry does not include them in any of the search functionality that they have across the wide range of um, both researching your genealogy and also on the DNA, DNA side of it, okay? Um, next comes our sharing preferences. A lot of times people may wanna share with other people so in this case, I am the manager of a kit, and then I shared it with somebody, MGH, and she is listed as a collaborator. A collaborator can see all your shared matches, but they can also um, add notes or add colored dots, and I'll show those to you a little bit later. But so they can collaborate and work on your shared matches. If you select the role, the role of viewer, those individuals can take a look at your shared matches, but they can't change anything on your um, DNA results. They, they're not able to um, put in notes on those people. If you do have um, individuals that you're related to, being able to view their shared matches add so much more value to your DNA test results. And um, 
I can show you, I've done a huge project with one of the branches of my family where I have four of us that are all related as distant cousins. And we've shared our DNA, um, shared matches. I'm a viewer of them, but I'm able to pick up more um, relatives that perhaps I do not show in my DNA um, shared match list, but maybe a second cousin that um, individual shows up there. And so I get a more well-rounded view of all those individuals in my family and where different branches ended up, um, you know, who they are, where they settled, more about the family. And it makes my family tree more robust by being able to share um, that information. That being said, I typically, when I do share my shared matches list with other people, I typically only give them viewer access and it is only close people that I know and trust to be given a collaborator um, access where I would be willing for them to um, change my colored dots or add notes to it or something like that, okay? Going on down this huge long list, it does um, talk about test management. And this is where you would be able to find how to download your DNA um, data. And so you click on that and it asks you a question or two, are you sure you wanna download? And you have to enter your password too. So they do um, make sure that you're really knowing that you're downloading um, the DNA data. It does download as a zip file. If you open that up, it probably won't make any sense to you because it's a whole big long string of letters and numbers and characters. With the zip file, even leaving it closed, you can upload it directly to those other companies like MyHeritage and Family Tree DNA. And then finally on the bottom of that, you do have an ability to delete your DNA test results whenever you'd like. However, just be aware that that is permanent. So if you delete, then you would have to retest in order to get um, any sort of information back. So deleting is not hiding, it is being wiped away from the ancestry um, database altogether. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead um, well, just going back real quickly, does anybody have any questions about any of the settings? I'll set there. I can, I'll answer questions at the end as well if you think of anything. Um, but I just wanted to kind of stop um, and see if you had any questions with that. So we're going to jump into ethnicity. And that's the first panel there on the left-hand side of our dashboard, our DNA dashboard. Um, it's entitled Your DNA Story and Ethnicity Estimates. And um, what this tells you is where, where your family may have deep roots, what country, what, um, where in the world your family came from. And a lot of people test just to find out this piece of information. So in ethnicity, they do have three different components of it. The first one is called side view. This is something brand new. It just came out within the last two months. So if you haven't seen it or you don't know much about it, um, now's an opportunity. I'm gonna talk about it for a little bit, um, but now's an opportunity for you to go in and, and see what that looks like. We also have our ethnicity estimates and genetic communities. So side view is something that Ancestry came up with. And what they're trying to do for us is to see what our DNA inheritance is by parent. And so even though you may not have tested your parent, this is what they predict your parent um, DNA um, ethnicity might be. So in this example, you can see that um, there's parent one and parent two, and they came from Germ Germanic Europe, Ireland, Scotland, and the Baltics. And when you look at the circle there, um, 
divided, parent one is primarily from Ireland and Scotland, and parent two is primarily from Germanic Europe and the Baltics. And because I know this test taker and this test taker's family, I can easily say, oh, the German side, that's his paternal side, that's his dad. So with this, parent two is that um, brighter green color and his family is from Germany and a little bit from the Baltics. And then parent one on that side, they're from Ireland primarily and a little bit of, of Scotland there. That is his maternal line. His mom's from um, Ireland and his dad was from Germany. So that was pretty easy for me to tell who dad and mom was. This is another example of somebody else where if you take a look at this, you have parent one. And um, if you take a look at the graph on the side there, you can see that that green color is from France and 49% of parent one's ethnicity came from France. And parent two is a much more wide ranging breakdown. So we have France, we have England, Scotland, Jewish people of Europe, Wales, Cyprus, Norway, and Eastern European. And with this table here, it tells you the breakdown of where the ethnicity came from, um, whether it's mom or dad, and identifies what all of these different colored segments are. And again, because I know this test taker and I know this test taker's family, um, her, fa her family, her dad came from England with a rumor that they're from Scotland and um, mom's family is from Quebec. They came over in their early 1600s and then they came to the United States at the turn of the 20th century about a hundred years ago. So they have very deep roots in Quebec, which is what that um, French ancestry is showing, almost 49%. So here again, it's very easy to determine um, who is mom and who is dad. And so this is what it um, looks like, is part of you are inherited, um, you have parent one and parent two, but all together, that's what makes up you. If you take a look at your inherited circle of ethnicity and have a sibling who's also tested and take a look at their circle, they're going to be different because you inherit 50% from mom and 50% from your dad. Um, and those are conjoined to become you, your brother or sister also has that, but that 50% may be a little bit different um, that is selected, that is passed along to you than it was to your sibling. And that's why you see differences between uh, various siblings is because you each get different pieces. And when I was talking about going back and collaborating with cousins, this is one of the reasons why, because each cousin inherits a different portion of DNA. And so you get, oh, it's called coverage. You get more DNA coverage of all of the genome from that, from that family line, okay? So it is at a advantage if you do not have your parents available to test, to go ahead and test siblings, or certainly um, being able to test first or second cousins. Because if you can break down who that second cousin line is, you're getting back into your uh, grandparent and great grandparent line and narrow down um, what shared matches that you do have in order to identify what branch of the family all of your um, DNA came from. So here's an, with this one, um, if you take a look here, we do have. For parent one, we do have this bright green color and this more turquoise green color. We also have those same colors uh, reflected here. And for this test taker, 
he has very deep um, American roots. His family came over on both sides pre-American Revolution. And so although he knows a lot about his family here in the United States, trying to dig up records pre-1750 or so um, back in Great Britain is um, difficult. So he may not know the core of where he came from. So when you take a look, you can see with the test taker, how those two different sides blended to be a, um, a much brighter, um, bright green arc, a lot larger. It's almost, I'd say what, 40, 45% of his ethnicity. So how do you determine, how would he determine who is parent one and parent two? Well, what you'll wanna do is you'll wanna um, take a look um, right here at what is unique between parent one and parent two. And so this subgroup right here is what is unique in this family. And so when you take a look at the comparison between parent one and parent two, the first four are from England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. So they're all from Great Britain. Again, that's not gonna be providing enough clues for him to determine who mom and dad are, um, which one is parent one and which one is parent two. But if you take a look at the next grouping, that small segment that I highlighted, we now find that he has an ancestor from Mali, um, Nigeria, the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Cameroon. So he has somebody from Africa. And if you take a look at that percentages, parent one has 0%. And parent two has about 6%. And if you quickly do the math there, as I said, we inherit 50% from our parents. So you divide that by two, you inherit 25% from your grandparent. Divide that by two again, your great grandparent is um, about 12 and a half. Divide that one more time, you get back to a second great grandparent where you inherit. 6.25% of your um, anticipated DNA comes from a second great grandparent. So not only have I identified parent two has um, somebody from African ancestry, but I know where to look for it. With that 6%, I'm gonna start looking at the second great grandparent level. And um, before DNA, I had researched this family. And this is something that's really important that DNA never works in a silo by itself. You can't just grab your DNA results and your shared matches and figure everything out. Everything has to be supported by documentary evidence. Everything has to be supported by doing research into the family and figuring out who these people are. One, um, very big caveat here, instead of being a second um, great grandparent, maybe there's more than one individual that passed down African ancestry to this individual. So I'm starting with what's the most obvious, but I may have to dig a little bit further. I need to double check that the tree that I built is complete enough to second great grandparent level, maybe the third great grandparent level, to see if I can identify any other individuals that may have African um, descent. And so with this test taker, he um, had told me that his grandmother's grandmother was a um, Cherokee Indian. And so he was, a portion of him was Cherokee. And I went back and I traced his family tree and I dug through census records and land records. And I was looking for that Cherokee um, individual and I never found her. And when I get the DNA test results, there is no Native American ancestry listed in her ethnicity. Now, is that possible? Absolutely. Again, because you inherit different pieces, 
from both mom and dad, over the generations, some of those pieces get dropped off and you lose the ethnicity from one of your second, third, fourth great grandparents. It no longer shows up in your DNA. It may show up in your cousins, it may show up in your siblings, but it doesn't show up in yours. So it's quite possible that story that he had a Native American um, individual in his family tree is true and is just not showing up in his DNA results because it's dropped out from his ethnicity. However, when I did research this further, I did discover that um, there is a woman that is his second great grandmother who was um, born in slavery and freed in the 1850s. And presumption is now based on the records. She was freed as an adult. And um, we believe that her parents were a slave woman and her actual owner was also her father and he freed her as an adult. And this woman um, did marry a, a white individual and then she had about 12 children. And I wanna say about half of them married African-Americans and half of them um, did marry other um, Caucasians in the community. And she is listed on some of the census records some of the um, death records for her children as mulatto or as African-American or as white. So um, the color that is listed on those records changes very often. Um, but I do think um, what occurred in this family is that the Native American story was um, commingled with the fact that there was this um, freed slave as one of their ancestors. So you can find out all kinds of information because I now know that I can identify that parent two here is mom and parent one here is dad. Again, when I talk about how Ancestry is trying to make more informed consumers, they have over on this side, more information about how ethnicity is passed down, how you can inherit um, DNA from your parents, and how do they know this? How, what do their sidelines, how is that technology developed, and how do they determine who is parent one and parent two? And in a nutshell, what they're doing is crowdsourcing because they have such a large database they're able to separate out these individuals come from one side and these individuals come from another side of your family. Um, it's a shame they don't provide the chromosome browsers that other companies do provide um, with that chromosome information. We would be able to figure out a lot of this information on our own. All right. So that was side view. That is something that um, just popped up within the last two months or so. If you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to go ahead and do so. Um, the next portion that you'd find there is your ethnicity estimates. And with side view, um, they did, Ancestry did again, update the estimates of your DNA. So, here is an example of, this is the same exact test taker. And on the left-hand side, you'll see his ethnicity is 54% from Ireland, 32% Germanic Europe, and going on down. That was taken um, about 18 months ago, two years ago. Whereas this is the same exact test taker when I opened up side view, it prompted me and said that they had updated ethnicity results. And so I went ahead and updated those results. And this is what um, came about is that now Germanic Europe has jumped from 32% to 49% and Ireland has decreased from 54% down to 48%. 
Now, has anything changed with this individual? Absolutely not. What's changed is ancestry is getting smarter and able to refine what your ethnicity is. And this is the same test taker that I showed his side view with. And um, his parents, one was a German Protestant and um, was one or two generations from Germany. And his mom was from, um, is Irish. And both of her parents immigrated from Ireland to the United States. And so as a whole, they have very distinct ethnicities and you wouldn't see a lot of crossover between Germany and Ireland, um, where say, for example, that other um, test taker that I showed you where they had so much of Great Britain, there is you know, crossover between Scottish and Irish because of the immigration going back and forth and stuff like that. Um, but these are very two distinct populations. And so you don't see a lot of crossover. So I do expect to have, you know, about 50% of each of them. So you can tell that Ancestry has gotten a little bit smarter and the information that they're providing is a little bit more accurate to line up with the research that I've done over the years on these families. So if you do click on um, one of these ethnicities, it will bring up a map. So this is my Germanic Europe. And you can see the map on the right-hand side, it covers not only all of what we know of today as Germany, but we also have the Netherlands, Belgium, um, Austria, uh, Switzerland, you know, a lot of Eastern Europe are all thrown into Germany and they don't narrow it down any further than that. If you take a look, these estimates on the left-hand side, that 32% again is that older estimate, but it does have a range there between 28 and 49%. So even though they were giving the number of 32%, if I took a look at the range, they were spot on with that 49%. And now my ethnicity that they provided um, just recently with the side view update, I do now have 49%. And again, they're giving me a range now of 38 to 59%. So Ancestry is getting smarter and its ethnicities are getting better. This is an example of my Irish side. And so that Ireland, it did show that it was 54% and then um, adjusted that to 48%. But on the map, the map did not change at all. So with this, they not only have my ethnicity as Ireland, but they've been able to break this down into different communities. So I have Munster, Ireland, which is this gold um, section down at the lower left-hand side. And then, um, so right here, and then up here, this is Connaught. And I don't know if you can see this circle here. If you take a look, it says West R Roscommon, East Mayo, and Northern Galway. Those are all counties in Ireland. And where they meet is right here in this inner circle. And again, down here, when you take a look at the gold, we have Munster, but then we have um, Northern Kerry and Northern Cook. We have Northwest Kerry, and then the Dingle Peninsula, which is this oval circle right here. And sure enough, I've done um, testing. I know where these individuals are because of doing my paper research. And um, on my Irish side, on the Irish side of this test taker, their mom came from a community right here, Glen Maddie, which is within 20 minutes to half an hour drive to Roscommon and uh, County Mayo. And then down here, this is where the O'Brien, that's their surname, the O'Brien family came from. And they're from right there at the mouth of Dingle Bay. That is where their family 
uh, was born and had lived for several different generations. So if I'm taking a look at my O'Briens and I have no idea where they came from in Ireland, this gives me a huge clue as to where I should start looking. If I had a huge list of Tom O'Briens from Ireland born in, you know, 1870 or so, I would not start looking in Northern Ireland. I would not start looking around Dublin. I would start looking down in the area where these three concentric circles are because that's my best bet. That's where the deepest roots that this ethnicity is providing me. So um, sometimes, you know, it's Germany and it doesn't give you any information, but on other ethnic um, areas, ethnic regions, Ancestry has been able to pinpoint and narrow down a lot more. So make sure that you not only take a look at your estimates, but you want to um, dig deeper into what they have to say about your family and where they might be. And so we have a genetic, couple, couple yeah. questions uh, that um, I'd like to go over now, if you can. Sure. Um, Sandra asks, so our family supposedly has a Native American ancestor. When I researched this side of the family, I found Melungeon, which I understand is triracial. How do I sort this out with Native American ancestry? Um, I, you can look it up, but there is a great book that Roberto, uh, Roberta Estes just wrote all about Native American DNA ancestry. Um, their ethnicity is very distinct. And um, so you would be able to do it, but you're gonna have to dig into um, whatever paperwork you might be able to find. And because what it sounds like is, are you trying to separate out what, racial group, whether they're they're African American or Native American. Um, I and I believe it's it's um, the third ethnicity, maybe Spanish. Um, anyway, yeah, you're gonna have to dig into the records and it probably wouldn't show up necessarily on census records, but perhaps if you're digging into um, things like land records, you want to get into the community records and see if they are using race as an identifier. So it's Tom, you know, the Native American, as opposed to Tom from, you know, South Carolina or whatever. They use they use it as an identifier, um, and that is probably the best way that you would be able to dig into um, where these individuals are. So in my case, when I, I was looking at my ancestor, I was able to go back in time and find her on a census where she's listed as a mulatto and her children have listed her race kind of all over the board. So I really had to dig into her records, find what community she came from, find what land records, her marriage record, and then going back um, able to find paperwork that mentioned her when she was being freed. Um, so it, it's taking a look at all those outside documentation um, records as opposed to just using DNA. Now, with using DNA, you can identify other shared matches that also have that same ethnicity. And so, more than likely, they are related to you through that same branch of your family. And that way you can find other people and they may have records that have been passed down in their family that tells you more about the genetic community there. Okay, we have, um, Charles had a couple comments and a question. Yeah. Does I agree with your comment that if ancestry.com did provide a chromosome browser that would help their co consumers with side view and other helpful information that would help us with DNA analysis. So 
why do you think that Ancestry.com does not provide a chromosome browser like the majority of DNA companies? That's the great unknown. I know um, there, we have no idea, you know, um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it certainly would be helpful. I know people that um, have more leverage than I do have pleaded the case more than once. Um, everybody, you know, it's a shame that they don't and they should. And um, as consumers, it would be quite helpful if they did provide that information. And a lot of people take their DNA from ancestry to um, my heritage and 23andMe or, or family tree DNA specifically for that functionality to be able to use a chromosome browser and find out um, more about how individuals are related based on a chromosome level. So I don't know why they don't, they should. They're having customers leave to other companies to utilize the other companies' tools. One more question. Uh, someone asks, I believe I had Melungeon ancestry from the Northeast Tennessee area that was once part of North Carolina. I'm not sure how to verify it though. So again, um, by digging into the local records to see what you might be able to find out about the community there um, is how you would be able to dig into it. If, if you did have it, it, I guess, does it show up on your ethnicity um, reports that you do have um, that ethnic community? But digging into those records, you do wanna always take note of the time period that you're taking a look at. So for example, um, the family that um, my um, family that had the slave in it, they lived in Eastern Kentucky and Virginia. Well, depending on the time frame, they they were in they lived in the same place, but it switched from being Virginia to being West Virginia. And so you'll want to make sure that you're looking at at the time and place that your ancestor lived. Who was the governing body? Was it in Tennessee? It's probably Tennessee today, but it may have been a different state at that time. So you'll want to take a look at um, the state and local records of whatever that community was at that time. So for example, my Quebec ancestors, they lived um, in New Hampshire for a while, but it was part of Massachusetts. So to find their records, I needed to dig into Massachusetts records as opposed to New Hampshire, because at the time, New Hampshire didn't exist. Okay. Uh, the same person responded that yes, um, she has DNA from four of the seven continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. Wow. That is awesome. Um, I would also network with people that have the same ethnicity you do in your shared matches. And I can show you a little bit more about that when we get into the shared match portion of um, my presentation a little bit later on of how you can double check the ethnicity and see how they might be related. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and um, get started and mention genetic communities. A lot of people I think gloss over this. Um, so again, here is Ancestry trying to educate you as to what is a community and how they might be um, related to you. So this is a subgroup of your ethnicity. It's people that have lived in the same place at the same time. 
So these are the genetic communities of that ancestor who is half German and half Irish. So one of his communities, genetic communities, is Ohio, Indiana, and Eastern Kentucky settlers from 1700 to 1975. And then it helpfully explains that um, it's connected to the regions of my Germanic Europe and Scotland, which to me is kind of an odd because I would have assumed Scotland would have been thrown into my Irish ancestors. But, um, and then as a genetic, genetic community, it is broken down again into subgroups. So we have Southern Indiana and then we have Southern and Central Indiana. So all of this is spot on. My German ancestor came over from Germany in um, the 1840s. He settled in Southern Indiana. He moved to Cincinnati and then he moved to Indianapolis, Indiana. So these genetic communities are spot on. The next um, genetic community is the Upper Midwestern Settlers. And again, it's connected to Germanic Europe with Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Again, um, this I would have kind of questioned, but I have done research. And so my ancestor who came over from Germany in 1850s, they, um, going back another three generations in Germany and then fast forwarding down their line, that other branch of that same family actually came over to the United States, settled in Wisconsin briefly, and then moved to Iowa. And so uh, fast forward today, five, six, seven generations, um, their descendants are still living in the upper Midwest, okay? And so, and then we also have not, we've talked a little bit about that. So here is um, the next community, which is um, in Munster, Ireland, which is the North County Kerry, the Dingle Peninsula, et cetera. This group has over 1 million other ancestry DNA members. Lots and lots of people came from County Kerry to the United States, to Australia. A lot of immigration came out of this area. But if you click on these areas, um, you do again find lots more of in information that I think is very interesting that people may not dig all the way down into what is available there in ancestry. They stop, they see the map, they see that they're 50% German or 50% Irish, boom, that matches what they have and they move on. So when you dig all the way down in here, featured matches, this shows actual shared matches, actual test takers that match you that are also in this genetic community. So this genetic community for me is my O'Brien side of the family. So if they're showing featured matches, more than likely they're related to me on the O'Brien side. Or, you know, it is possible that as you go back, you're, you have your four grandparents and a great grandparents that maybe one of their great grandparents came from County Kerry and one of their great grandparents came from somewhere else. Maybe they came from Galway. And the connection, the closest connection, the most recent common ancestor that I'm matching on in my DNA is from that County Kerry or County Galway area. So don't automatically assume that, aha, this must 100% be, but it's more likely than not that the featured matches that um, Ancestry is showing are on that um, branch of your family that is also from that area. And then as you scroll down, you have community history. So it talks a little bit about the land and the people that live there and um, kind of gives you kind of a background as about your ancestors. And as you um, go down at community history, they've broken it down into different time periods. 
So if you're in the United States, it may talk about um, the Revolutionary War time period. It may talk about the Civil War time period. So here it's talking about 1775 through 1825. County Kerry is known as the home of the outlaws and rebels. It just sounds kind of fun. Um, and it tells a story about who my ancestors might be. And then they've also included some great historical articles. So this one has um, information about the Irish potato famine. And so it's this huge long article, more about the Irish potato famine, how it came about, how it impacted people, and how it um, was a huge push factor for immigration. And maybe if your family lived during this time in this place, this may be a reason why they immigrated and left um, the community that they were living to somewhere else. And then finally, it lists off um, people that are in your family tree. So these people, Daniel O'Brien and Nora Foley, are my second great grandparents. And they lived in County Kerry, they lived in this time and place. They experienced the Irish potato famine. Um, they didn't come over. Um, their descendants came over um, right around the turn of the century. Um, so they lived and survived the Irish potato famine, but it, it certainly impacted who they were and who their family was. And so this gives you a great place to jump into the his, history of a time and place that your ancestors lived and experienced that you may not know about. Um, so I always find it fascinating. I come from a history background. Um, that's what my degree is in. So I always like taking a look at what they have to say and maybe learning a little bit more about the family. All right, so that is our communities. So we're gonna be jumping into shared matches. Shared Matches is a center um, panel here. This is what everybody, um, when they talk about doing DNA results, they always wanna look at their ethnicity and then they wanna look at their DNA matches and who these people are. And they just wanna jump right in. Um, one thing I kind of wanted to point out here is that Real quickly, I can, by pulling up this dashboard, it tells me that it is linked to a tree. So if you have a question, did I link a tree to um, my DNA results? Right there, I'll tell you whether it's linked and who it's linked to. Um, and typically it would say Ed, but just the way I built my tree, I listed Ed as living. Um, my sister who has done DNA testing and she did it all on her own. I, I wasn't managing her kid or anything. Um, she thought because she had built a tree in ancestry and she did her DNA testing, that ancestry just automatically linked those together and it was available. And, um, I think a lot of people automatically assume that. And Ancestry does not. So make sure that you do go ahead and link your tree to um, your individual. So this is my tree um, where you see living here as the home person, that is Ed. And then you can see we have all of our German side over here and you can draw a line straight, divide it in half and hit the maternal side. That is all Irish. The, the Irish uh, portion of the family. And then as you see, I do have blanks over here. I'm missing a mother and a father or a mother down below. Um, my tree is not complete. And one of the things that I need to keep in mind as I proceed and take a look at my shared matches is that, oh, I might know that this individual is related to, for example, a holly, but can I also rule out that they're not also related to me on a Mueller side of the family? 
you need to, to be aware and always keep that in mind. How complete is my tree? Where are my gaps? And how that might impact whatever assumptions that I am making. Okay, so when you're jumping into your shared match list, one of the things that you'll want to do is start out by identifying your known relatives. And then we're gonna be creating family groups with colored dots. And then you'll review your shared matches going from your known to your unknown. So in a nutshell, you get your entire shared match list and people are quickly overwhelmed and they're like, I have this list, what do I do with it? Who are these people? How are they related? Can I figure out anything more about my family because I did this DNA test? And so what I recommend that you do is you first go through the list, look at um, any of your close relatives, they would jump up right away, brothers and sisters, um, your first cousins, and scroll down and take a look, those first cousins, those second cousins, do you recognize those surnames? Do you recognize that family? Can you um, say, oh yeah, I remember my mom talking about, you know, her cousin, and maybe this is them. So you want to identify all those shared matches. And then the next step is we would be able to, going from those shared matches, be able to divide up the family, hopefully, into different branches. You know, are they related on which of your four grandparent lines? Or even going back further, another generation, can you break down and figure out what of your eight great grandparents, what branch of the family are they coming from? And then once you've identified what branch they might be coming from, you can go from those shared matches and see all the rest of the people that you haven't been able to identify with and take a look at their shared matches. And as a result, you may be able to say, oh, they their shared matches with me are all O'Briens. So more than likely, they too are related to me with the O'Brien side of the family. So identifying all of our known uh, relatives. So here's an example of this shared match list. And if you take a look, you do have um, names, you have abbreviations, you have initials, all kinds of um, usernames that may be helpful and may not. So you wanna ask yourself, do you recognize them? Ancestry here also has um, included their estimated relationship so they're a second to third cousin. They share about 155 centimorgans or 2% of their shared DNA. So in a nutshell, what that means is um, the centimorgans are how closely related they are to you. The higher the number, the closer they are related to you, the, more, the smaller the number, the more distantly they are related. The next column here, this is whether they have a tree or not. So you can see Sandy does not have a tree. She has not built a tree at all in ancestry. These individuals, a lot of times, oh, I got a kit for Christmas from somebody. So I took a test and I figured out that I'm Irish and German and they haven't gone any further. They haven't done any research. So they don't have a, a tree. The next individual, Ron, he has a private linked tree. So Ancestry sees that. They know that a tree is linked. It has 52 people, but you can't see any information about it. But if I did a surname search and I was looking for all of the O'Briens that are in my shared match list, if Ron was related to an O'Brien, his or had an O'Brien as a surname in his tree, he would pop up in that list. And so that's one of the ways that you can narrow it down. 
So my O'Brien married um, somebody with the last name of Ward. So if he pops up on O'Brien, maybe I'll, I'll do a surname search on Ward. And if he pops up there, then I know he's a descendant perhaps of that couple. If um, Ward doesn't pop up, well, maybe I'll go back a generation and I'll say, okay, if he's not, no, is he an O'Brien and an O'Connor, which is the next generation back up um, and be able to narrow down how this person might be related, what generation by doing that surname search, okay? RG, that next individual, they have built a tree, but they're like my sister. They didn't attach the tree to their DNA. What this means is that tree is out there and if you click on it, it takes you one or two more clicks further, but you can take a look at that tree, okay? So that tree is not hidden, they just haven't linked it to Ancestry. And Ancestry is making it a lot easier for us to track down that tree and be able to view it. So do go ahead and click on unlinked trees because you will be able to see it. And then finally, you do have a public tree. That's awesome, Pamela, Pamela created a tree. Unfortunately, she only has three people in it. And a lot of times those three people is Pamela herself and mom and dad, and they're all still alive. And so you have living, living, and living, which doesn't help you much, but at least she started, okay? Um, and then finally, in this last column over here, you do have, um, do you recognize them? And you can click uh, yes or learn more. Um, learn more just kind of gives you a breakdown as to second cousins and third cousins and such. Um, if you click yes, it will be able for you to go ahead and label the relationship. And then going back to where it says the second to third cousin level, they will change that to be whatever relationship you identify them. You know, so if they are your second cousin once removed, you can put that there. And so you won't see this range. You will see the actual relationship that you have. Um, I always go in and I also make a note of how they're related to me just because I tend to work on people and then I come back you know, three months later and I'm like, I think I know them, but I'm not sure. So I wanna have the notes because I've already figured out who they are and how they're related to me. So here again is an individual. Um, I'm taking a look at her, you know, do I know who she is? So I wanna take a look at um, Catherine, and then I also wanna take a look at her tree. Do I recognize any of those surnames? And you can see they're marked in green. Those um, surnames are surnames that are shared between um, the individual, test taker and Catherine. So the test taker and Catherine have the same surname. So more than likely, that's how they're related. So if you recognize them, you would go ahead and click yes, and up this box would pop. And it says, what side is Catherine on? Mother's side, father's side, or both sides? And so once you select that, then it'll pop up um, the relationships based on the centimorgans that you shared. So Catherine shared 120 centimorgans and do you know what the relationship is? Second cousins, half second cousins. You can click on that. You can also click on um, more possible relationships. But if you do click on one of these, that will go ahead and change the relationship in your shared match list. Okay, so that just kind of helps you identify who these people are and um, how they're related to you. So here we are, we have our shared match list. And so we've been able to identify, I you know, first identified whether it's on mom's side or dad's side. So um, it lists father's or mother's side. And then they've, these individuals have been labeled. First cousin, first cousin, first cousin once removed. This one, 
I know it's on dad's side, but I don't know exactly how they're related. And um, also down here with John, I don't know exactly how they're related. And so that is how once you've gone through and identified all of those individuals that you know um, how they're related to you and just start at the top of your list and work your way down identifying all of your known relatives. Hey, Ange, quick yeah. question. Um, someone asked, uh, what does both sides mean? Both sides, there are people that are related um, both through mom and dad. So um, it could be something as easy as, um, you know, second cousins marrying. I, on um, my family, I have two brothers married two sisters and then they had children. But if, but if I'm researching them as I go back, instead of having, um, you know, different grandparents at the next generation back, they share the same set of grandparents. We're not getting anything new because you have the, the two brothers marrying the two sisters. And so um, fast forwarding down, some of those third cousins of mine are related to me on, on both sides of the branch, that branch of the tree, okay? And so you can find that out. Um, there's a really nifty tool at um, GEDmatch that you can utilize. Again, this is a tool where you download your ancestry data and you would upload it at GEDmatch. And they have a tool there that says, are my parents related? And they will quickly um, scan the information that you've provided and they will be able to tell you if your parents are related. You know, and it could be back several gen generations back. Um, on the Quebec side of the family that I was talking about, there are people that are, their fifth great grandparents are fifth great grandparents five times over. And um, because there was a, it's a, was a smaller community and it was isolated. And so there was only subset of individuals available to marry. And so, you know, it's not necessarily they're marrying their cousins, but going down three or four generations, um, they are intermarrying. It's called endogamy um, when that happens. So I have that not only in the Quebec family, but um, I have that in the Irish, my Irish people um, in the Dingle Peninsula, they married. Um, some of the same families over and over again. And they did um, chain migration. So a lot of them came over and worked for the railroads. And so they settled in Indianapolis, Terre Haute and East St. Louis. And some of their neighbors came over at the same time. And so they'll see the same surnames pop up in Dingle, Ireland as well as Indianapolis. And so they met and married and raised their family here in Indianapolis, but their families knew each other two and three generations back um, further in Ireland. And there may be marriage back um, in both sides um, in Ireland and in the United States. So there's all different kinds of ways um, that people may be related on both sides of the family where it may not be known and it may not be a close relationship. All right. Um, so next we're gonna dig into creating family groups. So again, here's my family tree. And um, hopefully you recognize this, you'll be able to go into what I call the other side of ancestry where you've built your family tree. And over on the top left-hand side, there's a way to toggle from it being a descendant tree down where you show all the cousins and aunts and uncles and siblings and such to a tree that, that um, looks just like this. And so what this is showing, it's removed all the cousins, aunts, uncles, siblings, and it's just showing parents, grandparents, great-grandparents going back your um, ancestral tree. 
And then if you go on the far right hand side, there's a print button and you can just print this out. That's what I'd recommend. I always like to have a piece of paper right there next to me as a reference. So print this out. And then I labeled each couple there on the far right hand side, you can see couple number one, two, all the way down to couple number eight. So this is, if you, um, this is my, my, the parents of the test taker, grandparents, great grandparents, great, great grandparent level. Okay. So you have 16 individuals here. And once after you do this, you can certainly go out um, back further another generation if you like, but this is kind of where I get started. Um, there's a lots of different ways of how to use the colored dots, but I'm showing you my preferred method of how I do this. So this first couple I have here and um, they are labeled um, number one and going on down as I said. So here's an individual. Steve, and he's listed as my second or third cousin. And um, over there on the far left hand side, or right hand side, there is that plus symbol. If you click on that plus symbol, that is how I am able to add him to a group. And so when I click on that, it pops up and it says, um, it gives me some different options. So I want to add one DNA match to. I can either create a custom group, I can have them into the starred matches, or this is a group that I've already created. Um, I created one called paternal and I assigned them a blue dot. So I decide to create a custom group. So right here, I can type in the group name and then I can assign him a color. Any color, um, I can pick any color I want. Some people, you know, kind of go the rainbow. Some people try to get blues and greens for the paternal side and reds and pinks for the maternal side. Uh, whatever color you like, however, um, that corresponds and makes sense to you. Any um, color dot that does have a line through it, that has already been used. So I already used the light blue and the pink because I was. Uh, initially just labeled everybody either a maternal side or a paternal side. One of the things that you can do with these groups once you've created them is um, do a search and only have whatever color dot you've selected come up. So I could select my paternal matches. And in this case, I have 62 labeled paternal matches. And so I can focus just on that side of the family um, in order to do a little bit more research. Hey, Ange, I have a question. Yeah. Can you only yeah. assign one color? You can, so no. So when you're creating your group, your group gets only one color. However, for any individual, you can assign them as many colors as you want. So as we go forward, I can show, um, I've labeled them um, paternal, but then I labeled them, I broke that down and I labeled them Holly. And then I broke that down a little bit more and maybe put them in two or three different groups. So they'll have three dots after their name. Um, so you can certainly do that. So um, you can have um, as many colors as there are available here on your individuals or um, just one. Okay. So this is what my um, list ended up looking like. So um, the zero one, as you remember, going back to my family tree, that was that first couple and their surnames was Goons and Moore. My second couple was um, Mueller and I didn't know who his wife was. And so it's an unknown. My third group is the Holly and Sander couple and going on down to all of those individuals. 
So Ancestry defaults by listing these alphabetically. And you know that's perfectly fine. And you can have them listed alphabetically by surname. I really like being able, like I picture that tree in my head, what's paternal, what's maternal. And so that's kind of how I think. And I also have surnames that have been used in different sides of the family. So like I have Andersons that I have in different branches of my family. And so I don't want to put Anderson here and Anderson here and be confused as to, is that my paternal side? Is that my maternal side? Um, so what I did is I put leading numbers here. So 0, 1, 0, 2, all the way down to 10. If you don't have that um, leading zero there, uh, where it says for guns, then it'll do one and then it'll do 10 and then I'll go back to two and then 21. So that's why I have the leading zero there. And then finally, you can see I have used other things. Review this. These are um, stuff that something's weird going on and I need to really dig into what what's going on, what's happening. Are they related to me in two different ways? Something's odd about that DNA match that I've noticed, but I don't want to spend the time because that may be a rabbit hole that will take me hours. And that's not what I want to focus on, but I want to make sure that I come back and review that. Um, if you see number 10, still need to figure out, those are people that I know if I spend some time with them, I think I can figure out who they are and how they're related to me. Um, I also, do location searches. So I search for locations. Um, so I have listed that there. You can also search on ethnicity. So when we're talking about people that have unique ethnic groups and they want to have only those individuals, they can sign them a colored dot for anybody who has that ethnic group. And you just and kind of work your way through. Quick question. Yeah. Um, Michelle asks, is your number system based on great grandparents? Yes. So let me go back a couple of slides here. So this is my number system. So number one is Gunce Moore. So it's based right here on this grandparent. This number two, it, I said Mueller and unknown. Well, so I know, or I'm assuming that her father's name was Mueller. And um, the mother, I have no idea who that might be. So number two is Mueller and unknown. Number three is Holly and Sander. And so that is how I created those groups. So number one is, is my paternal, paternal, paternal line going back through. Okay. Let's see. So here, um, is a case of individuals and how they're related um, to me. And you can see this individual has all of these dots. And the reason for that is because I used, you know, eight dots for each branch of my family. And this individual, Brittany, is actually um, the pest taker's grandchild. And so she shares all eight of those. Um, surname, she, she's a descendant of all of those branches. Now, when you, we take a look at Corrine, she's a um, first cousin, so she is only in four of those branches. So I have all four of those branches listed. And um, there's also a star here, and that showed up, um, if you go, if we go back here, I'll just go back. So when you create a custom group, Ancestry already has a defaulted star, uh, starred matches. Before Ancestry created the colored dot system, they had this star system where you could star a match. And when they added the colored dot system, they didn't want to take away because a lot of people had utilized the star matches for 
all kinds of things and they didn't want to have all of those consumers be upset with them because they lost all their work with their their starred matches so they left that there and starred matches are a little bit different than the colored dots um so starred matches they're like a light switch three you either click on the star and it's added or you you know click on it and it's off and um you know so it's an older system but a lot of people have incorporated it into uh, what they're doing so for me what i did is if i knew exactly who this person is and how they're related to me i would put a star there if i had used my shared matches i've identified my known people and now i'm trying to figure out my unknown family members i could figure out whether they're an o'brien or they're a guns so i would want to add them to that branch of my family i would want to assign them a colored dot because i know what line they're on but I might not know exactly who they are. And so that's what a starred match tells me that I know exactly who they are. Whereas if they just have colored dots, I know what branch of the family they're on, but I not, I may not have been able to identify exactly what person they're on. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Another quick question. Yeah. Oh, no, wait a minute. She just answered it herself. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Um, oh, oh, but if you, uh, Rick just says, if you send me an email, I'll send you the JPEGs of two color dot sets I used for GGP and two GGP. So great, great grandparent and second great grandparent. Right. Um, so when I talked about writing out the, um, how they're related to me, you can see here on Corrine, this is, um, very much how I do it. I identify the couple and how they're related to me. So Simon Guns and Sophia Holly is that's spelled wrong. The most recent common ancestor it should be M R C A. She's a first cousin to the my test taker, and Corinne's um, mom was Dorothy Guns, who was the daughter of Simon Guns and Sophia Holly. And so I have it written out right here available to me. So I know exactly how she's related to me and I don't have to go back and figure out who that is. So Corrine is really easy because she's a first cousin, but when you're getting down to a third cousin or um, you know, more complicated relationships, it very much helps in order to have that identification listed there. And you'll want to come up with a style guide. That's what I did. I came up with a style guide by using my family tree and labeling each couple with a colored dot with a zero one. And I know exactly um, going forward what that means. That's what if you guys have not started doing this process of adding colored dots or um, have only just begun. I'd recommend writing up a style guide as to how you're doing everything. And with that style guide, it'll help you have more uniform information. So for example, I used to not put in their relationship and um, then I'd be confused as to, okay, are they a second cousin or a third cousin? And now answer, Ancestry has um, added being able to put that relationship right up here, you know, underneath um, the first cousin and second cousin. I could relabel that, um, but I added it to my notes because that feature wasn't available at the time I started making these notes. So the other thing is I um, have printed these out and I take those notes. So I want to make sure that I had the most recent common ancestor listed so I could group those together. So you know how you work best and develop a system that works best for you. I'm just showing you my system, but there's lots of different systems out there. 
Um, but consistency is key when you're working with so much data um, in order to organize it, filter through it. Um, being able to be organized helps you be more effective in your research. You certainly don't wanna spend hours redoing something that you've already figured out once. So um, here is some more individuals. So here is Caroline. I have no idea how she is related to me. So what I wanna do is I wanna go into her shared matches. What this provides is a list of shared matches that um, are shared between the test taker and Caroline. So Caroline has her whole big matches and I have my whole big long list of matches. And what it's doing is showing where we overlap, what shared matches we identify with. Hey, Ange, another question. Yeah. Um, it says, if you have shared access to DNA match results as a viewer, can you see the added notes and colored dots, but just not change or add them? Yes. Great. Yes, you can. Um, so here I did shared matches and unfortunately we have no shared matches. Ugh. But if you take a look at the trees, we don't have any shared trees either. So what do you do? One of the things that I can do is I can go into the ethnicity estimates. And here I can see that um, Ed over here, this is an old screenshot, so he's still showing that he has 32% Germanic Europe. And um, Caroline has zero Germanic Europe. But look, up here, we both share Irish ancestry. And so because I know Ed, this test taker, has um, is 50% German and 50% Irish, so I instantly can say Ed's maternal line is Irish. Caroline must be a maternal relative, okay? We do need to keep in mind here, um, Ed is really blessed with his DNA that it separates so cleanly into two unique groups. But remember when we were showing all those different um, ethnic estimates in side view, where you know we had that one test taker and his four top matches on both ethnicities were from Great Britain. So he may not be able that test taker may not be able to do this. Um, but if you do have unique um, ethnicities, this is a great thing to take a look at. So for example, my test taker that, that had that African ancestry, if he took a look at these ethnic um, estimates and you saw um, that you are matching and you both have that um, African ancestry, and you had zeros just like um, Ed and Caroline have with Germanic Europe. If you're not related any other way, then you know that you're matching on that, that ethnicity. Um, even if there's a little hint of ethnicity, you know, it could be that I want to say they're related through Ireland, but it very much could be that they're related through um, maybe a Scotland branch or an English branch, okay? So uh, you can't just say, oh, because the biggest shared ethnicity is Irish, they must be Irish. If there's any potential here, then you need to take that into consideration. And you certainly need to take into consideration um, any gaps in your tree. So when you took a look at my tree, I had some unknowns. And so Caroline may fit into one of those unknown ancestors that I don't know their ethnicity for. Okay. Hey, quick, another quick question. Yeah. Um, Michelle asks, would the amount of centimorgans shared affect matching ethnicities? 
No, they're two totally separate things. So the amount of centimorgans is how closely they're related to you. So when we took a look at Brittany, she had over a thousand centimorgans. When we take a look at Caroline, she may only have 35 centimorgans because she's a distant cousin, okay? But the ethnicity portion of that is, is totally separate. That's kind of what you've inherited from your family um, going back generations, okay? The amount of centimorgans that you have in common is just reflected in how closely you're related to the test taker. The higher the number, the closer you are related to them. All right. So using shared matches. So what we wanna do is we wanna work from our known to our unknown. Okay, so here is Mark. And I had no idea who Mark was, but I see here we have this common ancestor. This um, leads you into through lines, which um, we will be talking about. I don't think we're going to get to it today. I think we're going to um, discuss it next time. But um, common ancestor leads you into through lines. And what they're doing here is Ancestry has identified how these individuals are related to us. So you can see their tree here. And again, marked in green down here at the bottom, these are the surnames that I share with Mark. And over here, this is the common ancestor that we share. If I click on this common ancestor, it will bring up their relationship and provide a visual tree as to how they're related to us. And that kind of jumps into what through lines um, will show us. So here's an example of what I've done with my shared matches. So, this individual here, I know that they're related, um, their most recent common ancestor are Simon and Sophia, and I've been able to identify um, this individual, and so I have a scarred match here. This individual, Paul, I figured out he's a holly. He has a private link tree. So how did I figure out he was a holly? Well, what I did is I went up to, I clicked on Paul right here, and then I clicked on shared matches. So now I have Paul and my test taker as the two individuals. And what do they show? What shared matches do they, they show in common with? And when I, oh, sorry. So when I take a look at uh, colored dots here, they all are in same colored dots. They have a blue because they are on the paternal side and they have a yellow because the yellow is my Holly ancestor, my Holly line. And so even though I don't know who Paul is, I can go down the entire um, list of shared matches and I can click and turn on um, and add them to my Holly branch. Now, is this perfect 100% um, identifying that they are on the Holly branch? No, but there's a higher tendency that they would be on this Holly branch because I, again, always need to remember about tree completeness. Do I have any holes? Is there a possibility that they're related on? a great grandparent that I have not identified with, that's possible. Is it possible that they are um, related to me in two different ways? Yes, that's also possible. And so this is how, um, you know, first I identified all of the matches that I knew, and then I went through and I identified those individuals 
so I can see how they're related to me. And finally, I'm working through my shared match list. And I'm saying, okay, if I have an identified individual like AJ, who is shared um, on my Holly side, and AJ and I have all of these shared matches, you know, Paul and HG and Emily, then I can go ahead and color code them to say that I think they are on the Holly side of the family. And how you color code them is you click on that, on the far right-hand side where there that is, the pencil is, and that will bring up that whole list of colored dots that you have created. And um, you will be able to select those to put them into whatever group that you want. So Another if you question. take a look. Another yeah. question. Um, Shared match may not have received the same ethnicity DNA and still be a relative on one side or the other, right? Not sure I'm being clear, but trying to learn to use the shared ethnicity to determine relationships as paternal or maternal. Is there a sure way? Can you repeat the first part of that yeah. question? She's asking, um, shared shared match may not have received the same ethnicity DNA and still be a relative on one side or the other, right? Yes. So, um, yes, it is quite possible to have a shared match. Um, you know, just take a, a second cousin, for example. You may have inherited... Take, for example, a second cousin. You would share a great grandparent, okay? And your great grandparent's DNA has now split to your grandparent, your parent, and yourself. So it's split four different times getting down to you, okay? And for your second cousin, again, it's split several different times getting down to your second cousin. And so what your second cousin has inherited and what you have inherited are different portions. So maybe you got Wales and Scotland and she got Irish and German. And so by the time you get down to yourself, your ethnicity may not be the same. You may not have inherited those pieces. And ancestry rounds things up and down. And so, it's possible that it didn't meet the threshold that Ancestry was using. So it is quite possible that you're, you are related to an individual that does not share the ethnicity, but where you would find that is down really far in your tree. When you're talking about the third cousins, the fourth cousins, the fifth cousins level, when the DNA has split so many times the pieces that you get from each individual um, great grandparent, um, second great grandparent has gotten smaller and smaller. Um, you do inherit them. Um, we're now coming to find out with chromosome browsers and such is your, your genetic DNA is inherited more in chunks. And so a chunk can fall off. And so um, the ethnicity that you share may not show up when you're taking a look at the ethnic view that I was just showing you, and you can still be a match. The second part of her question, um, she said, is there a sure way to use shared ethnicity to determine relationships as paternal or maternal? No. It gives you a clue. It absolutely gives you a clue. And unfortunately, um, not everybody splits cleanly into Irish and German. A lot of them are like um, one of those last test takers I showed you in side view where they share a lot of, you know, Great Britain ancestry and you can't determine whether it's mom or dad. All right. So um, once you've identified the individuals by dots, 
you'll want to go up here and you'll utilize this toolbar listed here uh, where it says unviewed common ancestors, message notes, trees, and groups. You'll want to be able, you want to utilize those in order to identify your family members um, a little bit better. Unviewed, if you just want to see what new matches that you have, that's what you would click. Common ancestors is what I um, showed you in the screen previously, where Ancestry has taken your tree and their tree, and they found a common ancestor. And then um, when you click on that, it does show you, it illustrates um, you come from this sibling, you come from this sibling, and um, now your second cousins and who your common ancestor is, what that common ancestry couple is. Um, if you've messaged somebody that just kind of will bring up the messages to that individual. Um, notes, that's where you can um, search in your notes. So if I went to search in the notes, um, I was looking for a specific word or I knew I made a note about something, I could look in the notes. Trees. This is one of the things that I, I do do is I may click on, you can click on two or three of these. So I may click on unviewed people that have public trees because I want to see how quickly I can identify some of those new people. And I know if they don't have trees or their trees are private, um, I'm going to have to do a lot more digging in order to figure out who they are. Groups is where you get these colored dots. And so um, if you click on groups, then I could click on, I just wanna see all the people with a yellow dot, all the people that share the Holly surname, and I can do that. And then over there on the far right-hand side, you can see um, search, and that's where you can search for, um, specific surnames that I had talked about previously. You can search there for surnames. You can also search on locations. So um, one of my ancestors came from a small town in Ireland called Glen Maddie. So I can click on, or I can search for Glen Maddie and see, are there any other individuals that came from Glen Maddie? Now, are they related to my ancestor who came from Glen Maddie? Probably because she came from Glamati, she moved to Indianapolis and she lived in Indianapolis and her descendants have lived in Indianapolis um, for over a hundred years now. But, you know, that is one more clue as to who that DNA match is and to be identifying them on what branch of the family they are. And maybe I'll, I'll take a look at her tree um, the individual that came from Glen Maddie and search, and maybe I'll recognize other surnames or get other clues as to when her family lived in, in Glen Maddie versus when my family lived in Glen Maddie. And that may give me hints as to um, what family group they came from. The other way I use this is for individuals that Say, for example, I did not know the maiden name of my Glen Maddie ancestor. So if I have another match from Glen Maddie and their tree has these various surnames, maybe those are records that I want to look for that have those surnames and see if my surnames pop up in those um, records as well. So those are some of the tips and techniques that you can use all of your DNA matches as clues to where, where in all of the internet, all the archives, all of the, the um, repositories, narrow down where can I search to find those records, to find those answers, the answers about my ancestors by being able to take a look at what other records are out there. Okay, so all, all of this, this DNA portion should be used, utilized as hints to further your research to help break down those brick walls. Okay. Any questions?
So um, one of the things that I was hoping to do today is not only um, give you a walkthrough of Ancestry, but the last portion of the dashboard in Ancestry is through lines. But when I added that into this presentation, it would have added another half hour or more um, to it. So I didn't want to um, have everybody, you know, stay here that long. So I'm certainly going to add through lines um, next time. We'll be meeting again in September. I will be discussing through lines. And then um, also going into family tree DNA and my heritage and taking a look at how they handle um, the ethnicity, how they handle um, my heritage just came out with a way um, to identify all of your their matches with colored dots. They they use a system that's similar to Ancestry, but they have their own unique version of it. And so um, taking a further step and looking at other companies and how they do things. Um, if you have not done so already, I believe on the handout, it does show you um, what companies can allow you to download your information or upload your information. And so go ahead, if you have not done so already, um, and explore those other options. When we're taking a look at um, DNA, our goal always is to further our genealogy research, to learn more about our family. And although Ancestry has the most matches, it has the largest um, database, the most test takers, that's not helpful to you if your cousin hasn't tested there. And so by taking your DNA and having it at many different companies, you're just able to fish in several different ponds and you'll get um, new results. So you may see some of the same people, your cousins have um, put their DNA in several different places, but you'll always discover lots more individuals um, by taking, taking a look at those other um, companies as well. Um, Heather asked a question. Are there uh -huh. any countries that are not using Ancestry very much yet? So Ancestry is uniquely American. It, it started out here in the United States and it has um, spread glo globally. So a lot of people do utilize it, but um, find my past is um, the company that is based in England. And so they have a lot of information and records for um, Great Britain, and they are affiliating themselves with Living DNA, which is a new um, DNA testing company. You can upload your information there. They have been promising great things. So like how, in Ancestry, you have my Irish um, were broken down into different ethnic communities and I could really pinpoint where they came from. Find My Past and Living DNA are hoping to be able to do that to pinpoint locations in England as well as in Germany. Um, it's They've been promising it. I think it's taken them a lot longer to get all the technology out there. Um, they just came out with a new update with to see how much Viking ancestry you may or may not have, but I believe they're, they have an additional charge to get that portion of the ethnicity. Um, my heritage was started in um, Israel and their focus has a lot of Eastern European records that they initially started to collect. And you will find a lot more people who currently live, test takers that currently live in Europe, um, in my heritage, where ancestry, the bulk of their test takers have come from America. So um, 
Each company is different and unique. 23andMe does not accept uploads from other companies. And a lot of people there have um, taken it just for the health component. However, they have a lot of unique tools. And so, so um, people who are interested in their DNA for genealogy go there. They have a great chromosome browser and what have you. So um, overall, all the companies have pluses and minuses and it doesn't matter what company you utilize, you're, what, you're wanting to find that um, company where your, your magic mystery cousin has tested. And so it doesn't hurt certainly if you can upload your DNA for free to, to go ahead and do that. Um, my email is listed there on the screen. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I work in a school setting, so um, the summers, I am very much free to dig into DNA and I am quite happy to um, help anybody if you have any questions, if you wanna message me privately. Um, I certainly don't mind um, helping you out or answering any further questions that you might have. Okay. That's great, Ange. This was a tremendous presentation today. There are a lot of thank yous in the, uh, the chat, um, and I agree. I learned a lot as well. Um, for those of you who are still on, uh, we have recorded this, and I will um, send out information to everybody about how to access it once it's ready. It should be hopefully sometime next week. So thank you all for joining us. Our next um, uh, presentation we have scheduled to be uh, Saturday, September 3rd. So again, I'll send out information to everybody about how to register for that when we get closer to the date. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody have a great rest of your weekend and uh, we'll just touch base with you next week when I have the recording ready.